This episode of Finding Demo Surf Fishing is being brought to you by The Sinker Guy. Head on over to thesinkerguy.com and take a look at all the stuff that Chip's got going on in the Sinker Guy garage. Sinkers, you know he's got them. It's in his name. Sputniks all the way from two one ounce all the way up to five. If you need custom, you need to reach out to Chip. He might have you covered there. The Bruno Rake, very, very nice. It's been doing good things if you've been checking it out on the social media world. Not to mention my favorite rig, the Mortician. He's got them right there all set up with snoods. Any other terminal tackle, he's got it in the shop. So head on over to thesinkerguy.com, get your order in, quick shipping, great customer service. episode coming to your ears hope everything's going good wherever you are and whatever you're doing i am happy to be back here talking to you again and this week we are traveling over just a little bit to the west here in the panhandle going over into the alabama side a little bit here we're going to be talking with greg finley of mad dog fishing if you haven't taken a look at him before you should find him he's got a lot of really really good content uh catching bull reds other good fish from the surf uh when I first heard of him, was all about bull reds and monsters, and he's just crushing them. It was a sight to see. And then I got to go fish with him once uh, when I got invited on a boat tour, and he's just a super personable, great guy. So, uh, you can find him on Facebook, uh, Mad Dog Fishing. Instagram, you can find him there as well. His website will be linked back in the comments. Take a look at his stuff so you can get everything set up there. And he does have a YouTube channel. You can find him on there on Mad Dog Fishing. All these links will be back into the pre-show and all the comments on there. You'll be able to find him. So without running my mouth the entire show here, let's bring him on. Welcome to the show, Greg. Thanks for coming on, man. Hey, man. Thanks. I Man, I'm super excited and pumped. Thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you for acquiescing acquiescing <laughs> i've only been wanting to put you on the show ever since after we went fishing with the that day at the youtube thing so i mean that's just me i've been sucking at not following up with you uh it's okay man i've been super busy and i know we've been trying to stay in contact and man i've just been running 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 trying to get take care of my clients and basically this just been keeping me super busy <laughs> I am glad to hear that because busy means good. Though so we we won't waste a bunch of your time here. We'll just get right into the podcast questions and get them going. Uh, so let's go all the way back to the beginning though, because I always like starting there. Tell us your story and what got you into fishing. Well, wow, that, let's go all the way back. Man. Yeah, man, <laughs> time machine time. Right, actually, fishing has always been my go-to because it was a simple sport. Uh, as a young man, you know, it didn't cost a lot. You know, if you had a cane pole and some crickets and in nearby water, you you could go fishing. So it really became, and I was good at it. And so it became my go-to sport. You know, I tried baseball and football and hunting, and none of it really clicked where fishing was just my sport. I could do it with a friend or I could do it alone. And so over the years, it has become my obsession and passion. I've dabbled in everything from trophy catfishing to tournament bass fishing, uh, offshore fishing, and now my main focus is surf fishing, which is really a challenging sport because you can't chase the fish. You have to pattern the fish. Yeah. So it has it really become my thing. Man, you have posted some seriously – monster great catches and a lot of them too i mean i've seen you offline with some of your other posts you just you going out fishing you catch some big monsters you like you have that dialed in yeah well i i learned a lot of that from catfishing actually the bigger the bait the bigger the fish once i figured out how to catch these big fish i it's just i've become an addiction and now i turn other people on to it but yeah, bigger the bait, bigger the fish, and the bigger the thrill. <laughs> God, you're so right about that. Well, you've been doing all that fishing your entire life, and here we are now. What type of fishing do you like to do? Personally, I am. I, I like to fly fish, even though I don't get a chance to do it as much anymore. Uh, I do like to fly fish, but I like to target these really big fish on light tackle, 
uh, something I'm not able to do with my clients, but when I go out personally, I target these really big fish with light tackle, but not light enough to where I'm having to kill the fish before I get it in. Uh, but it, it just makes for a really good challenge and it's, it's really good sport. That part right there, that has been like, that's normally brought up way later in the show. And I'm glad you brought it up so early. I think that's one of the few misconceptions people think of like, oh, I can have this fight for 20 minutes and it's going to be great. It's like, N yeah, no, you get it in, get it out, but have some fun with it. So bravo to you on that. I know that's a delicate balance. Oh, it is. And, you know, I learned that a long time ago, uh, fishing for stripers, uh, a striped bass will fight you till it's, it, till it's dead. Uh, so we had to use big enough equipment to get it in quick enough where it could still survive, but still have a thrill of the catch without just broom sticking it in, mm -hmm. as I call it, bringing it in green. Yeah. So, and the, and these fish here, uh, you know, the red fish, they're just, they're, just, they're a hardy fish, but you, you know, they, you can kill them if you wear them out too much. Reviving them becomes almost impossible. I mean, those bull reds are beautiful and they love fighting you. They love to fight, but man, they are. They're quick. I mean, I don't. I've had. I've only had one problem revive on a on a red, but I can imagine with the bull red, it's like, okay, come on, big boy, get get in there. That that's got to be that's got to be a little bit of an extra adrenaline rush at the end of like, come on, we can do this. You can go back. Oh, exactly. And everyone, every time you catch one, you you know you're fighting them for five or ten minutes, and the whole time you're wondering how big is this one, how big is this one, <laughs> uh, and but yeah, I. You know, I try to get them in within 10 minutes. Even with my clients, I use heavy gear, and I'm constantly standing there, you know, helping them out. So I'm really big on uh, catch and release. So, What is your favorite thing about fishing? Wow. Yeah. A lot. A lot. Uh, <laughs> golly. My favorite thing about fishing, I, I guess, is being out uh, on the water. Uh, water's my my serenity uh and fishing just adds to it but the thing i like about fishing you never know what you're going to catch uh you can be targeting one thing and catch something else you just never know so i, I guess it's the thrill the mystery of fishing uh, you never know what you're going to catch or how big it's going to be so it's not like hunting where you actually get to see what you're fixing to kill fishing you don't get to see what you're catching so it's it's a mystery and a thrill. It's that's about how I would wrap it up. I mean, it it goes straight to the core. Yeah. When you talk about that, that's funny for our area because we have such a great fishery between the hell of the whole Gulf Coast. All of us here in that area, we got such fun fishing and listeners. If you haven't been down here yet, you got to come down. We've got great fishing. We got great charter captains that'll take you out and get you on the fish. But like you said, we could be you could be targeting pompano. And you're going to catch red. You could catch a red. You could catch a blue. You could catch a Spanish. You never, you just never know what's out here. Hell, even sharks. It's just crazy. Oh, exactly. And I'd have to deal with that every day with my clients. You know, we may be targeting redfish and may end up landing a 200 pound bull shark or <laughs> maybe pompano fishing and hook into a cow nose ray. Oh, and yeah. Just, and I love it. I mean, it's just, you just never know. Yeah, that those cow nose rays, they'll take you for a walk. That's for damn sure. <laughs> they're, they're like, oh, you want to catch me? No problem. I can, we can do this all day. I got you covered. Yeah, those cow nose rays will, they're fun to catch, but they can make a mess. Uh, yeah. Usually they show up around pompano season. So, and you know, as well as I do, during pompano season, people are lined up arm to arm. <laughs> and when a ray gets on, it's running east or west and it will tangle up everybody. Yeah. God, oh, that is a, that's a, Pain in the ass day right there. I know I've, I've had that happen a couple of times with Justin and I when we've been out. So it's never a good time. Uh, have you ever had one? Have you ever eaten one? Because I, I haven't yet, and I'm wondering. I have not. Uh, I I love countless rays. I think they're a beautiful creature. I couldn't imagine killing one. Uh, but I have eaten stingray. I just haven't eaten a countless ray. Okay. I just think they're a unique creature, and I just never had the never thought about killing one actually yeah uh, this year was my this was supposed to be my year i was gonna be like okay this year i will have a ray i will you know because i got a lot of stuff i got to catch up on with the whole catch a florida memory thing uh but the 
I, I've been told they're great. They're tasty. I know a lot of the shark fishermen use them for bait as well. Uh, I just had to ask that because I know I know you and I have both caught some big ones. They're, you, it's hard to catch a small one. You, you always seem to find the big one when you don't want it. Oh, exactly. Exactly. And I've actually thought about eating one. I've eaten just about every fish I've ever caught in the surf just to say I've eaten it. I've even yeah. eaten my own bait before. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. and that. But that's one of the few fish I have not tried yet, so I'm curious myself. I'll split one with you. That way we can, you get you get all the bait you want. We can give it out, and we'll go with that. So e- easy to right. We, we can do a beachside catch and cook. Oh, there we go. That's a win. Ooh, so you've been. We're not getting into your charter yet here. Um, we'll get into that here in a second. For you personally, though, what is your favorite fish to target? I would say my favorite fish is is actually the redfish because they can get up to a hundred pounds. I don't know if anybody realizes that. And I think it's the world record's 98 pounds caught in North Carolina. Ooh. But the biggest I've ever caught is a 47-inch redfish, just shy of 50 inches. So my goal is to catch 50-inch red. So really, that's my favorite fish to target because I am after a certain size redfish. And until I catch it, that is going to stay at the top of my list. <laughs> Dude, a 50-inch red, that's going to be a beast. Absolutely. Now they catch them over in Louisiana like that, but here that would be an extremely rare catch. I've had clients catch some 47 inches, but we have yet to break that, that mark of 47 inch. Uh, one of the episodes I did not too long ago, we were talking about Texas fishing. And when I was like, oh yeah, we catch these, these reds, you know, these are bull reds. And he, he very, very politely said, that's not a bull red you need to come down to Texas and I'll show you bull reds. And he started sending me pictures of 50, 52, 54. I'm like, what the hell, man? He's like, oh, they're just big here. Wow. That is a beast. Yeah. Yeah. I cannot imagine that thing bending the rod. I'm like, okay, here we go. Let's get this in. Oh man. That that would just be, oh, that'd be a fight. Absolutely. You know, last December, I thought my son had came, had come down to visit and it was in December, and we hooked into a fish, and I actually thought it was going to be a world record redfish. Uh, it was absolutely monstrous. And, of course, it was freezing cold, and I had on sweatpants. And I went <laughs> to step out into the water to wrestle this fish, and I didn't want to lose it. Right. Well, it wasn't a redfish. It was a shark. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. I got it all on YouTube. But, yeah, the water was a little bit dirty, and it when it passed by the first time, I just knew we had our we had our fifty inch redfish, and of course it wasn't. It was a it was a shark. I, I quickly got out of the water. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> uh, again, the crazy things of a bycatch you never know. Oh yeah. What have what has been one of your favorite fishing memories? One of my favorite fishing memories, I, you know, I, I have a lot of them just because I do so much fishing, but I think my, my favorite memory was years ago. I was trophy catfishing, and I hung into a catfish, and I fought this thing for over an hour. And wow. All it did, it just kept swimming. And, I, and I've landed some, you know, 60 and 70-pound catfish within five or 10 minutes. And here it is, been over an hour, and I can't get this fish to come up. It's just swimming back and forth. And so I get impatient, and I crank the drag down on it and try to force it up, and the, the the hook straightened out. Oh no! After an hour of fighting this fish, I just I will never forget that moment because, like I said, I've caught some monster blue cats and flatheads that took me ten minutes to get in. So the mystery behind the size of that fish will always haunt me, <laughs> and will be a memory I will never forget. And oddly enough, that was probably 10, 12 years ago, and I think about it all the time. Oh, that is like the ultimate lesson learned in sadness. Like, I'm sitting here, and I'm hurting for you. Oh, a straightened hook. Oh, man, there's not many things worse than that. Yeah, I just sat down in my boat. I, I didn't cry about it, but I was pretty pretty <laughs> damn upset. I just sat there because I was exhausted from holding it, you know, trying to get this fish in for an hour, and I was using – Fairly light tackle for trophy catfishing, but not extremely light. I had, I mean, it had enough backbone. I could have got it in, but I was just, I, I was mad at myself. Oh. Uh, 
But yeah, that's that's probably my strongest memory. But I have a lot of other great memories too. And it, I can sit here and go through them all day long. You know, whether it's being up in the mountains fly fishing for trout, uh, the serenity, just being in the mountains, standing in a, in a stream, catching these wild trout. You know, it's. I think every location and every fish brings a certain memory to me. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. How could it not? Dude. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm blabbering here because all I can just imagine that and I'm sorry you didn't catch it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it's still down there waiting for you to come back and get it one day. Oh, it, it deserves to be free. <laughs> it earned it. I mean, it, it, it deserves <laughs> to be free. And I did, I did, I did go back for like three weeks straight trying to, <laughs> to do it again and nothing. I mean, I did get some catfish, but nothing like that. It was that was, I, I feel like that was my one shot, and I blew it. So <laughs> it is what it is. It's, it's why they call it fishing, right? Yeah, the ultimate lesson learned right there. So, oh man, that's a great memory. I'm sorry, it's a tragic, but a great memory. So that's good stuff. Exactly. I and mean, then I have a lot of memories with me and my kid. You know, taking my kids fishing for the first time. You know, first time they caught a trophy catfish, or first time putting them on a bull red. My youngest son, I, he he absolutely hates fishing, but I took him down fishing, and his first fish was about a forty pound black drum, and he just shrugged his shoulders. He's like, oh, "Okay," I was like, "Wow, okay." Most people be super thrilled, but it'll be a memory that he he'll, he'll last him a lifetime. Oh, I know sure. he 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 loved it. I think I got it on YouTube. I can't remember, but. Now that he's gotten a little bit older, he's wanting to go again. So I had to have some kind of impression. You know, going out with the kids always is so so rewarding and just yeah, it's like core memories every time. Oh yeah, and I, I love taking my kids out. You know, I miss Christian a lot. You know, he used to get. I never he, I never went fishing without him. Uh, I went fishing three times without him, and he pouted all three times. So, <laughs> and, and Christian's my oldest son, so. He he loves fishing, and you know my success has a lot to do with him. Really, I, absolutely. He was with me every step of the way, whether it was running the camera for my YouTube channel or getting up with me every morning to tar to pattern these fish. Whether it was pompano or redfish, we were going out in the mornings, at night. Uh, I mean, every single day, uh, trying to, you know, develop a pattern for these fish and. And we did this for two years straight. And so he was there every step of the way. And I don't think I would have done it without him. That's he's and he's a in the army now, right? Yes, sir. He is in the army and it's something he always wanted to do. Uh, and he, he's enjoying the army, but he's missing his fishing time. So every time he comes home, uh, that's what we do. We go fishing. That's some, one of the best things to look forward to, to coming home. And I mean, now you get father son time in the most best way. That's friggin' great, Greg. Seriously. Congrats, man, on that. I, I look forward to seeing you guys post when he comes home on leave. Well, I appreciate it. And actually I'm hoping, uh, I was going to try to get up to Washington and we were going to actually hire a guy up there and take our cameras and everything and, and do a father son video up there, maybe doing some salmon fishing. Uh, it just hasn't materialized yet. And, Right now, I'm not sure how much longer he's going to be in Washington State, but hopefully I'll be able to get up there and target some of those fish up there. They they have, you know, a great fishery up there. I just know nothing about it, so that's where hiring a guide comes in handy. Yep. Well, hopefully I can, maybe I can find a decent guide up there to send you a cool little recommendation. I won't, I can't promise anything, and I know you'll find somebody because you're in that business, which actually makes for the perfect transition for us here. You've been running Mad Dog Fishing for a while now. What made you want to start a guiding service? Honestly, I didn't. Uh, oh. I was I was doing my YouTube channel, and a friend of mine who owns uh, Fish Gum complimented me because I was still truck driving at the time, and I, the only time I had available to shoot my videos was on the weekends. And he just he made the comment that not very many people can come in one day, get as much content and catch as many fish in one day as I do that I should look into to start guiding. And, and I, 
quickly answered him. I said, I don't want to make it into work because I actually enjoy what I'm doing now. Well, I thought about it and I talked to Christian and we decided to, to give it a go. And that's what we did. And the first, you know, first year it was, it was kind of slow. And I was questioning, uh, whether I'd made the right move or not. And it, it's, it's a, it's a scary transition. I will tell you that. I can imagine. I mean, every guide that I've talked to has always mentioned the, yeah, it's a lot of fun, but you've got so much pressure on so many other things. Did I get the bait? Did I do this? I got to get the customer on. I got to get the customer on the fish. Is the weather going to be good? I, you have so many different facets that you have to always loop through to make sure that it's a success, successful trip. Oh, absolutely. And I'm just as nervous going out now as I did, you know, five years ago when I started uh, this. And it, you, you just covered everything, you know. Am I going to be able to catch the bait? Because I catch my bait live every single trip, uh, especially in the summer and fall. And that's one of my uh, things is I, I believe in carrying fresh bait. So I, I constantly worry about catching bait because there's been times that I struggled catching bait and go into a panic mode because I got clients I got to meet in an hour and I still haven't gotten any bait. So, and then once you're out there, you got to deal with grass. Uh, if, if you're unfamiliar with surf fishing, we got several type grasses that we have to deal with from June grass to sargasm and, uh, some other stuff they call witch's hair. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but, and then you got the weather to deal with, which as a surf fisherman, I can fish in just about any condition except for super high wind. And, you know, if the, if the wind's over 25 miles an hour, it's pretty much a no, it's just not going to happen. But you're right. There's a lot of things I have to deal with, and and that's just for one trip. And I have to do this every single day. I remember when you went on live with Fish Gum, uh, when Tony was doing Fish Gum TV. I remember you talking about getting live bait, and you're probably only the second or third one to, that's come on the show that's talked about, hey, look, this bait, the fresher, the better, and I catch my own. How is, I know this isn't in our questions, but how is the catching that live bait so much different than picking it up from the local resources that we have available? It really depends. Honestly, I catch live bait because just from years and years of fishing, uh, a fish is when it's in the, unless you're a catfish, but most of the fish in the surf, like redfish, uh, bluefish, Spanish mackerel, they're chasing something. And it's usually going to be fresh. If an injured, if it's an injured fish, it's going to be bleeding, which adds to the scent. If you buy bait that's already been packed on ice or frozen, you lose that blood content. Uh, you still have the scent, but it the scent changes. It's just like you can open when you open up a bag of, of shrimp that's been frozen. It doesn't smell the same as uh, fresh shrimp. So, and it, you know, that's. Part of the the keys to being a successful fisherman is, you know, knowing what works and what doesn't work. And live bait works better in surf than I would say. Now I say live bait, fresh bait. It can be live, but most importantly, it definitely needs to be fresh. That scent content from a fresh crab is undeniable right there. Oh, yeah. I, if if the crab is not alive when you kill it, it's not going to smell very good. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're one of the first, Chip was the first guy to really get me to use crab knuckles. Um, and I started learning about that, but you were one of the very first people that I remember talking about, like, you want to catch a big fish? You need a big bait. And look at this. Take half this crab, throw it out. Let's get a fish. And you even used whole crab before. Oh, yeah. I still use whole crab. The only problem with using a whole crab is getting it out in the surf because a whole crab is eight eight ounces. And then you got another four ounces of pyramid sand. That's a lot of weight to be heaving, you know, even 30 yards out in the surf. So you got to really have the equipment to launch a, a, a whole crab. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to doing your charter, what comes with going on a trip with you? You know, I try to make it as easy as possible for my clients. I supply everything. You know, I supply the, the bait, the tackle, 
everything but the food and drinks. Uh, you know, you know, I ask them, you know, if, if you want a chair to sit in, bring a chair, you know, make sure it has a carry-in strap. If you bring a cooler, make sure it's a backpack cooler or, or an easy cooling cooler to carry because where we may walk right on the beach and start fishing or we may walk half a mile down the beach and start fishing. So, you know, I try to set them up for success before we even get on the water uh, with their part. When it comes to what I supply, I cover everything. Uh, whatever it takes to catch fish, I, I'm going to bring with us, whether it's a variety of baits, rigs, rods. You know, I, I've got backup rods uh, because if I break a line, I want to be able to immediately grab another rod, get a line in the water because... You know, we've we've got a short window of opportunity and you know, whether you got a good surf, bad surf, high wind, low wind, current, no current, I have to be on my toes and I have to be super prepared on my end or it's not we're not gonna catch any fish. I mean it's if I don't provide everything, uh we you're not gonna have a successful trip. So I I tried to cover every area far as surf fishing, whether it's multiple rigs, multiple baits, different size rods for whether I'm I'm throwing out, you know, twelve ounces of bait and weight, or I may use a smaller rod and throw out just a, a small uh finger mullet. But I, I try to supply everything that our clients need to be successful. And that's the the, the key to being a great guide is not only you need to know where to fish, but you also need to be prepared for as tackle and bait. Yeah, that, dude, that's great stuff, especially being able to provide it because you already know what they need. So it, it takes all the guesswork out of the game right there. And that's that's huge. We are at the perfect time before we move on to the next question. We need to knock out a bait check. It is your first bait check of the episode. This bait check is being brought to you by Ninja Tackle. Head on over to NinjaTackleVA.com and take a look at everything that Matt's got going on. You need the bummy stick? Oh, hey, he's got them. The limited edition fishing rod. I hear a lot about it. The seven-foot spinner, the old go-to rod, my absolute favorite. I will not leave this house without taking that rod with me. It doesn't matter the type of fishing I'm doing. Always great there. Fishing rigs, lures, bait knives, optics for firearms. Got you covered. And if you are in the business of a tackle shop or you sell online, Ninja Tackle has recently opened up the door to people getting their hands on the new Ninja Dagger series. So if you'd like to get that information, please reach out to Ninja Tackle at ninjatackleva.com and uh, they will get in touch with you as soon as possible to get this going. You can get the links back on the website as well and from my homepage. So with bait being such a big one there and you've done all these pieces and you put this whole thing together from scratch... What is your favorite part about running a charter? The smile on people's faces. Uh, it's, m- most of my clients are from up north, you know, have never surfed fish, which is why they hire a guide in the first place. And they're expecting the small fish. And when they're landing, you know, 30 and 40 pound redfish or 200 pound sharks, the joy on their face you know, is just overwhelming, and it brings happiness to me because he, they're 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 ecstatic. And a lot of my clients are kids, and you know, when eleven year old is landed a hundred and fifty pound bull shark, along with three forty pound bull reds, that's memories that that will last him for the rest of his life. He can go back to school and brag about these pictures, and I think it's. The most important thing with me is the excitement it brings to them. Kids are so fun on the beach when they're fishing. It's just like like that pure joy. So I, we need to bottle it. It's so good. Oh, absolutely. And, man, I've been blessed. I've had some really great clients, really great kids. Um, you know, and even during when, you know, when the bite is slow, I you know, I try to keep them entertained. I'll put a, put a flashlight and a net in their hand and have them go catch crabs. And I'd be like, you know what? We're going to take that crab you just caught, and we're going to catch fish on it. And so they get excited about that. We'll catch a crab. We'll put it on a hook and put it out there. And when they catch a fish on it, you should see the joy on their face, the excitement. And 
you know, I, I absolutely love fishing with kids and they just, just the excitement is just unbelievable. Oh man, I can imagine. That's so cool. And plus you give them the whole, like that right there, the full circle. Hey, that kid's going to take that later on in life. And be like, hold on. I remember I learned this trick. Let me try this. So that that's learning all in itself right there. Oh, exactly. Exactly. I, yeah, it's, it's quite a thrill. Uh, and I still have my clients contact me from years ago and they book me every year for their kids. You know, they, their kids had such a great time. They just want to bring them back and do it again and again, even though they know how to do it now, they still in, enjoy my services and putting the, putting the rod in that kid's hand and letting him fight a 40 pound fish for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome, man. Uh, I've been smiling the whole time you started talking about this. So that's so cool. When, when it comes to your charter and your personal time, how is running a charter different than your normal personal fishing? Well, uh, it, it's when I go out personally fishing, I don't carry as much gear. Uh, in fact, I used to, but over the years I've learned to minimize, uh, I'll carry one rod, uh, just enough bait for a couple of fish because usually when I'm going out, it's usually to do a YouTube video. So I try to keep it simple and to the point. Now, if it's pompano season, it's a little bit different. I have to carry, you know, my cart and coolers and several several rods. But I, I keep it a little bit simpler when I go by myself versus when I'm with my clients. When I, when I take my clients out, I've, I've got everything but the kitchen sink just because I want to be prepared. I don't want to get out there and not have a pair of pliers or or be missing something i mean that is crucial uh as a guide you're expected to be prepared and so i load down when i when i go out with clients i have more than enough bait to make sure i don't run out of bait where if i'm fishing personally if i run out i go home it's not a big deal so i take my guiding a lot more serious than i do my personal time fishing okay makes sense right there you're over in the Alabama side. What is your service area? Um, I fish Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, and Fort Morgan. And that's usually from March to May. From June to December, I pretty much fish just the Fort Morgan area. Any reason why in particular? You got me, I don't know why, all of a sudden I got curious. Well, my Fort Morgan area is just an area that I studied a lot, and I know the fishery there during the spring. You know, we have the Pompano migration, and I have locations in Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, and Fort Morgan that I can fish. And I usually find out where my clients are staying. If they're staying in Orange Beach, you know, I'll try to fish the Orange Beach area to cut down on their travel time versus driving from Orange Beach all the way to Fort Morgan to do the exact same thing. Right. Uh, so I try to be courteous to the clients and try to fish as close to them as possible. If they have a house on the beach or a condo on the beach, you know, I will go set up at their place as long as I have access to the beach and I'm not interfering with uh, other people that are staying there. Very nice. That's cool. Courteous of you too. Well, how do people hope, how do people book a trip with you? Uh, well, I, I have a website, but most people, the easiest way to do it is to text me uh, the time that you're going, you know, an estimated time you're going to be in town, and I will check my calendar and see if I have any availability, and we communicate through text message. I tried to do the phone call thing, but I get so overwhelmed with, with calls, and I have a hard time keeping up with them. The text message, I can just go back, look at my phone, I can say, okay, that's so-and-so, and I can tag a name to that number. I had thought about putting where you can book online, but I stay so booked up now, uh, there's no need in paying an additional fee for something when I'm already staying booked up now. So what has been some valuable lessons learned after starting and running your fishing charters? Uh, don't quit your daytime job. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. You know, as a surf fishing guide, unlike a boat guide, I have to deal with the weather and, like I said, the surf conditions where I can't outrun it. So if if we have bad weather conditions or bad surf conditions, I, I can't fish. And it's seasonal. 
So we have a pompano migration, and we have uh, other fish that hang around year-round, but it's not like this year. I, there was two weeks I couldn't fish at all. I had to cancel eight trips because the grass in the surf was so bad it was unfishable. Yeah, and so that it was really bad this year, and it lasted for months and months. Thankfully, I was able to fish pockets here and there, uh, and a lot of it had to do with the the surf, the incoming or outgoing. So I, the big pockets of grass would be bad on the outgoing tide or either the incoming. So I would try to time it where we would miss some of the grass, and actually did very well. But it that it takes a lot of planning and a lot of work to do that. But it you know as a guide you surf fishing guide you're you just have to put up with so much stuff. Uh, other fishermen being in your area, you got to have the right bait. You got to have the weather doesn't have to be perfect, but it helps to have good weather, uh, at least a breeze. And yeah, it's just a lot, a lot of uh, can't think of the word I'm looking for, but a lot to put up with so i wouldn't if you plan on becoming a surf fishing guy don't quit your daytime job (laughs) Uh, let's move into uh let's actually talk about your youtube first and then we'll go into your tips and tricks here so what made you want to start a youtube channel uh actually i used to be a big you watch youtube all the time and uh i actually got to talking to a big youtuber Uh, i'm not gonna bring his name up but he gave me some tricks. He said, look, if you want to get into YouTube, start where you're at with what you got. If you got a cell phone, use that as your camera, uh, and you can you can get some editing programs. You can edit it right there on your phone. And that's exactly what I did. I sat down with my son. We talked about a name. We went through several names before we settled on Mad Dog Fishing, which I, looking back, I wish I had done something a little bit different, but it's worked out. And so it, I did it for fun, to help people that were coming down on vacation or new to the area to help them catch fish is how is the main reason why I got into YouTube and to help people. Because I used to come down here or I'd go to other beaches and, and didn't even have a clue. And this is back before YouTube. And so YouTube makes it a lot easier when you're going to a new area. You can pull up some videos and get an idea of how to fish that area. And that's why I started my YouTube channel. Well, you nailed the next part, too, of why. So that's even better. <laughs> Would you say that running a YouTube channel has made you a better angler? Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's made me a better angler. But it definitely... Running a YouTube channel is actually a lot of work. I don't know if people who who watch a lot of... It's a lot of work, and... When Christian was going with me, we were running three cameras at a time. And when you sit down in front of that computer, that's three cameras and, you know, 50 clips of video that you got to go through and, and decipher and put together and edit. And, you know, each video is anywhere from four to eight hours of editing, if not longer. So it's a little bit of money I make off of it. It's a lot of work involved, but I don't think it's made me a better angler. I think it's just helped me help other people be a better angler. That's a great way to put it right there, Greg. I mean, you, you're nailing the goal right there. You're helping people. So, dude, way to go. That's that's really good stuff. Yeah, well, I, whether I'm doing a product review, uh, which I love doing, if I, if I have a product and it works, dude, I am on fire for it, whether it's a, a reel, a rod, or a uh, a rig, uh, in even outside of fishing, if if I've got a product and it works, dude, I'm I'm stoked about it. I want to tell everybody about it, whether I'm making money off of it or not. A good product is a good product, and there's a difference between cheap and inexpensive. And so, my YouTube channel, I try to target all that stuff, uh, whether it's how to catch pompano or how to take apart a spin fisher to service. I never thought in all the time I've been doing, you know, this sort of content, writing blogs, writing articles, and then doing the podcast here. I never thought that doing the product reviews would be probably one of the most rewarding and easiest pieces of building on these brands. 
Oh my gosh, some of my biggest views are off my uh, product reviews. And I, I really want to get more into it. Like you said, it is it has exploded. You you do a product review, and everybody from the United States to China is going to pull up those videos if they're interested in that product. Yep. And so it it it's really it's really great to put in your content, whether you're blogging, podcasting, or YouTubing. Reviews are a huge thing nowadays. I've actually been. I know we're going on a tangent here, but that's okay because I can do that. It's my show. Um, there is such, I mean, there's so many things out there in our fishing world. You know, the, the always joke is lures are meant to catch fishermen, not the fish. But it, the availability of hearing from someone tell you, hey, yeah, this was good, or no, this is crap, don't use this, is it, it's so refreshing and, and useful. And I feel like the beginnings phases, a lot of people will look at some and then they'll look at like the price tag and whoa, I, I can't afford that. Like, right, you, you can't yet, but you know, you're also just starting out. You know, a, a good example being a ninja rod, a dagger rod. I absolutely, like I said in the advertise or in the bait check there, I love my dagger. They're not cheap. Now, if I was just starting out like when I did, I went to the local shop and I picked up a couple of rods and I, I talked to them and I didn't spend that much but you don't have to spend that kind of money to have such a good time in the surf. And if you already know what you're looking for, you can go to your, your YouTube's perfect example. You can go to a lot of these different ones. I'm like, well, what kind of rod are you using? Where did you start? Well, what products are you using? How is it good? How do I use it? Uh, I think a lot of people, some, I think a lot of people miss that, but the small groups do get it. And then that just explodes for everybody else and helps so many people make a better decision. Exactly. And, I'll, you know, and you said it perfectly. These people that are getting on YouTube are not your experienced people. Uh, if you're in it now, as far as a dagger rod, if somebody's looking at that, that yes, they're experienced and they have the money to, to, to get it. But right. like if you're, you're watching videos on how to catch pompano, then you're just getting into star fishing. So I'm putting out their products that reviewing that can get you started that, you know, if you don't want, you don't have, you know, $600 to sink in a combo, you know, you can get this combo or in this reel, and this will get you started, and this will last you a couple of years. Yeah. But as you get into the sport, as like with any sport, whether it's baseball, bowling, you're going to start at one level, but you're not going to stay there ever. You're going to constantly be getting better and better equipment. And that's where I'm at. I'm every year I'm like buying more and more expensive stuff. It, but that years ago I said, there's no way I'd spend six hundred dollars on a reel. <laughs> and now I'm like six hundred dollars, I want that thousand dollar uh Stella. Oh, the Stella. <laughs> Stella is really nice. I, I have no use for a Stella, but it's it's like buying a Corvette in an older age, you, you feel like you deserve something nice Yeah. every once in a while, you know, and the Stella's, you know, the, is a high end reel and, and every once in a while you want to give you something, something nice. Yeah. This was such a good example with the bowling thing. I mean, as soon as you said that in baseball, I don't know why my brain went to like, Oh, you know, you're starting with an Easton when you're playing as a kid. And next thing you know, you're moving up to, a Louisville or, you know, something like that. It's just progression. It's just part of the game. Right. And, you know, I, with you and me and some of these other people that review equipment, uh, you know, I, I review as I move up as well. You know, some of the stuff I reviewed years ago is low end stuff. And now I'm starting to move into some more high end gear. And, and in fact, as I'm getting a couple of views I plan on doing this year with some, some high-end conventional gear, uh, not super high-end, but for surf fishing. Right. And I, like I said, I love doing reviews. It's so easy. <laughs> You're moving into the conventional. I, I used to do, well, I thought you were per, pure spinning. You switching over completely? Uh, I use a lot of conventional when I go out personal fishing. Oh, uh, yeah. I've tried to use it. Actually, I used, uh, I got a Pen Fathom 30 that I was using for, uh, sharks this year uh, it's illegal to target sharks in Alabama from the beach but 
as a red fisherman, we still catch them. So I had to buy something a little, a little beefier. Uh, the conventional reels work great. The clients struggle with it because they're not level wine, so you have to constantly be putting the line on straight, and yeah. it, it became a real problem this year, and I kind of regretted spending the money on conventional gear for my clients when I should have just stuck with the spinning gear. But personal fishing, absolutely love conventional gear. Another lesson learned for this <laughs> for the struggle of fishing. <laughs> Make it simple. Yeah, oh, man, that that word. Oh, I love that word. Well, now we're going to move into one of my favorite parts of the show, and that's basically getting all the tips and tricks and knowledge out of you here and some stuff to help people out. But before we do that, we got to do our bait check. It is your second bait check of the episode, and this bait check is being brought to you by the Kids Can Fish Foundation. Kids Can Fish is a state and federally recognized 501c3 charitable foundation. All camps and clinics and outreach are funded by the website, merchandise sales, sponsors, and donations. If you haven't heard me talk about the Kids Can Fish uh, Red Bull tournament that they got out there in St. Simons Island in Georgia, lots of great things. They're doing really cool stuff for kids and trying to help them get out there and continue to fish. They have these camps that they're doing. They're not national yet, but they are growing. Who knows? Maybe we'll all start having really cool Kids Can Fish camps all around the place. So take a look at their website at kidscanfish.net. And if you're uh, going to be around the Georgia area and you were looking for a really fun tournament, the running of the bulls is going to be coming out soon. So take a look at that website and come back and have some fun. So with us moving into the old knowledge stealing piece of all the fun here, for you personally, how do you plan your fishing trips? Well, I try to plan my fishing trips, my personal fishing trips. I try to plan around the the tides. Uh, I prefer a fresh incoming or a fresh outgoing tide within the first couple hours uh, when it comes to surf fishing. That is key for me. Now, when I'm with clients, I have a certain time we meet every night, so the, the tides are irrelevant. You know, doesn't matter at that point. We still catch fish. But it's li- it just a little bit, I have to work a little bit harder uh, when I'm having to deal with a, a slack tide or something. So I really focus around tides a lot when I'm personal fishing. I never expect that because, I mean, we've only got one tide. So, I mean, it's it's a long run. So I can see what you're saying there. And I never really thought about our tides just because it's every time like, eh, whatever. Yeah, I'm just going to fish it. So, but the two, the, to- the two hour piece on top and bottom and the movement. I've heard that quite a bit from basically every other charter captain I've heard. That's really, it's funny that that's such a high value target. It is. Fish like that movement and, and the, the, what it does, it, a fresh incoming tide brings in a higher salinity of water. If and it just, for instance, if it's been raining a lot, well, your outgoing tides can be bringing a lot of fresh water down through the bays and the creeks. And so it's going to drop the salinity. Well, when that tide turns, is bringing in high salinity, which is what the fish prefer, and also the bait fish. Bait fish are real sensitive to salinity. So they're going to follow that water column and with with a higher salt content. So that's how I target my fish is these fish are chasing other fish. And those and that's basically all you're doing is following the bait fish. And they like the, the changing of the tide. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm definitely going to remember that one. Well, how do you select your spot to fish? Wow, that's really getting into the secrets. <laughs> I know. This is the one people are like, ooh, I don't know if I want to tell you this. <laughs> right. Well, for one, I run a drone every year because the surf changes. And I look for changes in the surf. If I'm pumping or fishing, I look for cuts in the sandbar. I look for rip tides, And I use a drone to do that. I go out every spring, I, I run a drone on all the beaches, and I map these these cuts in the sandbar. Now, you can do this by walking the beach as well, but it's just quicker with the drone. That way, if I get out there at dark, I already know where I'm going. I don't need to look at the surf and see what it's doing because I know where I'm going. Now, when it comes to the redfish, the area I fish is a huge flat. I mean, massive. Water is not over eight feet deep, and it probably covers the size of 20 football fields. So any pocket is going to hold bait fish. 
it's going to get them out of the current and so they're going to stack up in those those deep pockets and these big redfish or sharks where they're coming out of these shipping channels or coming out of the deep water and they know where to go they know where these pockets are and they come over there they feed and they leave and so that's basically what i've learned over the years is you just got to find some kind of change in in the bottom structure same way for bass fishing but it, for surf the a one foot dip in the surf in the in the sand will hold fish yeah that was like a super trade secret <laughs> holy crap dude that was awesome <laughs> I shouldn't be this giddy about that one, but that's, I never thought about that. I never thought, like you said, the one foot difference. I mean, I love structure, but that one part you talked about with the reds, the flats, and then, hey, look, the bait fish are going to hide in that hole, hit that hole, and you're going to get something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this, this bait comes in in massive schools. The whole school can't fit in that hole, but the ones that can will, the big school of bait fish is going to move on, but it's going to hold a significant amount of other bait and i know this because i've gotten down there and snorkeled it that's i did that just out of curiosity and sure enough it holds bait and what's crazy it holds a variety of bait it could be stacked up with blue crabs down in there i mean it just changes it's crazy uh pompano fishing you know we talk about fishing the back side of a sandbar the front side of a sandbar because that's a transition from shallow to deeper water. And it's also where a lot of bait hangs out, whether it's sand fleas or ghost shrimp or whatever. Yeah. Any kind of change in the surf is where bait likes to hang out. It's like a master class. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. <laughs> that's good stuff right there. Well, so yeah, now I, uh, I'll, I'll send you a bill on that one. Yeah, it's fair. That, that's. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly fair, I have to accept. Um, so when you get to your spot and you're all set up, now how do you set your gear up? And I know you said you normally go out one rod on your own there, but what I mean by that is, all right, I got my sand spike, I got my rod. Where are you casting and, and what kind of rigs are you using? Well, if I'm pumping up fishing, like I said, if I'm pumping up fishing, I do have more than one rod. And I stage my baits. Uh, I let the fish tell me where they're at. And I do the same way with baits. I put out a variety of baits when I'm pompano fishing. You know, I may set one five feet out in the, just past the first breaker. Uh, I may set the other one off in the trough, which is the area between the beach and the first sandbar. And then I may put one on top of the sandbar and one on the back side of the sandbar. And I'll have a variety of baits and a variety of rigs. I'll let the fish tell me what they want. So if I catch them up close, like the other day, I took Klein out, and we caught 40 whiting within 10 feet of the beach. All my other rods, same bait, same setup, nothing. So I just moved everything in closer, and we just wore them out. Nice. So you got to let the fish, you got to find the fish first. They may run closer to shore today, and they may be on the backside of the sandbar tomorrow. So you got to constantly be trying to figure out where these fish are. And let them tell you where they're at. Let them do the work. You just you just put your baits in different areas, and they'll t you'll, you'll figure out where they're at. Yeah, real quick, that's for sure. When you're talking about baits and on these rigs here, what kind of bait do you like to use when you're doing your fishing? Well, when I'm red fishing, I stick with anything from menhaden to mullet, blue crab, Pinfish. I, I I really when I go out with a variety of bait, that's what I go out with a variety of bait. I will have every, you know, I have pinfish trap. You know, I'll carry pinfish, blue blue crab. I'll even catch the ghost crabs off the beach and use those. So when it comes to redfish, I definitely go with a variety of bait because they can be feeding on one thing one night and change up the next. Uh, when it comes to pompano fishing, I use fish gum. Uh, you know, I'm familiar with Tony with fish gum. It's a great bait. I also use fish bites. Uh, it has worked for me. I, I bought some fish bites years and years ago when they first came out in Walmart, took it to the state pier, had no thought of 
purchase other than trying it. And since then, I have caught every species of fish that can be caught in the surf on fish and fish bites. Nice. So you like artificial and fresh? Yes. My redfish, I, I prefer just fresh. Right. Pompano, yeah, I can go either way. I can go with shrimp and stem fleas and, and ghost shrimp, or I can use synthetic baits like fish bites or fish gum. Okay. Or a combination. Yeah, I've heard about the stacks before. I, I can't remember if it was, it was you and one other person on the East Coast had told me about some stacks and different it up like that. That was pretty interesting. Definitely doesn't hurt the uh, myriad of bait because you need it. I mean, you never know what they want. I, I am a little shocked about pinfish and reds, though. I, I never, uh, for some reason, I didn't put that one together. I always thought pins are, you know, that much more snapper than redfish bait. Oh, anything that, that and I don't use, like, super big pinfish. I use three-inch, three, four-inch pinfish. And if it's moving in the surf, uh, a redfish is going to go after it. Redfish is a predator fish. Now, if you're up in the creeks, they can get a little more picky because they're usually after one particular type bait but in the surf anything that moves is dinner i'm gonna have to remember that this year man and you're using live too you're that you're not talking about dead pins right oh live and dead oh uh, okay that's, i started out using live bait and it and then before the night would even get halfway through half my bait was dead so and i was continuing still catching fish and i thought well there must be something to this so literally now when I catch my fish, my bait, I put it on ice and to the surf we go. So when I'm when I'm putting the last bait on at the end of the night, it's still bleeding, it's that fresh, but it's not alive. Because what's happening is you're putting this bait out in a strong current and the current's moving that bait back and forth, back and forth. So they don't know whether it's alive or dead. It's still fresh. Right. Yeah, it's not like you had it in the freezer, and it's been there for a right. month waiting. Right? Yeah, I don't, I don't fish with frozen bait at all, mm -hmm. ever. Oh, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. One way for you to up your catch game, right there. Get that, get that live stuff. Get that live good stuff. So if you go to invest in a cast net. Oh, dude, cast netting. I still look like, yeah, I look like a child still throwing mine. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> It's so bad. I I tell people all the time if you're if you're living down here, you got to learn to throw a cast net. Start with small, whether it's four and a half or five foot cast net, and work your way up uh, to a seven or eight footer. Uh, my go to is a seven foot cast net, but I also have a twelve foot cast net, and but it's mainly for uh, mullet the mullet run. I've heard great things about the mullet run. Oh, yep. Yeah, it's always fun to see those guys. Uh, not too long ago, I was fishing with Mike in his boat. We uh, we were coming back in, and over the trestle, I watched this guy throw down his cast net and pull up an entire, just a buttload of mullet, and big ones too, not the tinies. Oh, yeah, and those big ones, those are the ones I'm using for bait. Oh, wow, really? Horse mullets, huh? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I cut them up, but... right. Yeah, there's there's not a mullet too big that I won't use. In fact, is the bigger the better for me. And the reason why it keeps the catfish from stealing my bait. Really, that's interesting. I never heard of that before. Yeah, and if you, most people don't really, I don't know, if pay attention to the mouth of a mull. I mean, a, a a bull red. They actually have a huge mouth. You can stick your fist in their mouth, so they can eat a big bait, and they prefer a big bait. It's almost like a big, it's almost like a largemouth bass to me at times. Absolutely. And my one tip is don't stick a finger in their mouth when they're alive. <laughs> yeah, no, don't do I that. almost got my thumb broke last year. Really? Oh, no. Yeah. yeah, it was a slow night and we had only caught a couple of redfish and we ended up hooking a monster bull red. And I went in the surf to get it and I noticed the hook was barely hanging on so i just reached down and stuck my fingers in its gill and i jammed my thumb in its mouth Ooh. to to make sure i didn't drop it and it locked down my thumb and went to shaking i, I thought it broke my thumb oh. because this uh, 30 pound fish is just going crazy and i can't 
I mean, it took the hide off my thumb, but it didn't break it. Oh boy, yeah, that's a, that's a scary moment right there. Uh, I will be the first to admit I don't lip fish. For that reason right there, I'm terrified of that. Yeah, everything in the surf can either cut you, sting you, or bite you. Yeah. I tell my clients all the time, don't put your fingers in the mouth of any fish in the surf. A blue fish, they have teeth like a piranha. A red fish, they have the power to crush an oyster. So, you know, crushing a human thumb is nothing to them. Yeah, that's a, that's a Monday. Oh. And then you know, try to keep your fingers away from a shark's mouth. <laughs> Pro tip right there. Yeah. <laughs> I almost got bit this year for the first time. It was... It was it was a scary moment. Mm. And it doesn't take much for those teeth to pierce skin. They they it's a very light little oh hold on. Arr, done. Oh yeah. They brush up against you with those teeth. It's it's gonna you're gonna be bleeding. hmm Yeah, for sure. What do you do if you're gonna go to a brand new place that you've never fished before? Wow. Uh, hire a guide. Yep. <laughs> And the reason I say that is because they already have the experience and the knowledge of the area and the location. Now, if I'm bass fishing, that's one thing. But if I'm targeting like salmon or trout or a surf fish in another area or offshore fishing, power guide. It's worth the knowledge that you're going to learn, whether you use it to go back again or it just it's going to save you time unless you just want to get out there and and just try your luck it's better to hire a guide if you're willing to get on fish uh because they're already experienced they know the area the location and they're pretty much going to take care of everything for you so it's an in and out deal uh and money well spent well the final question for this one here how do you adjust your tactics for fishing when the bite isn't on fire well, after the panic mode kind of eases off, <laughs> and I start quest- quit questioning myself as a guide, uh, you, you, you really just you just constantly got to be, I'll start changing bait more regular, keep the bait a lot fresher, and, and start, if I have to move locations, I will. I don't like doing that, but I will if it's that bad, and, and we've had to do it several times this year. Uh, just because of grass, but just keeping that bait fresh, constantly changing it every uh, 10 minutes because I know I've got enough bait to do that, Uh, changing out baits where I may have caught one redfish on a blue crab and hadn't had a bite since. I may go to a ghost crab or or a poop mullet or more pinfish on. You just constantly got to be changing your baits, uh, try to – to entice them to bite. Now, sometimes they're just not there. Uh, for whatever reason, it's rare, but it happens. And it, as a guide, it hurts. It hurts your feelings and it hurts your client's feelings, but it is what it is. I can't chase these fish down. I can't make them come to me. But if they do come to me, I'm going to be ready for them. My client's going to be ready for them. That sounds like a proper setup right there, and now you know. So... I love that you added that part too about sometimes they're just not there. And we ran into that a lot this summer. I mean, it was, this has probably been, that. this was the worst summer that I remember uh, for all the, the weirdness that we had with the June grass, sargassum, all of it. It was just such a strange year. It was. And the fish pattern this year was off than it has been for the last, uh, I'd say, three years. Well, since Hurricane Sally. Uh, it's been pretty consistent. This year, I really had to change tactics a lot this year. Like I said, the grass was a huge problem, and it was bringing in a, a, a weird pattern for it, what these redfish were eating and how far out they were feeding. It, it, everything changed up this year. It's really weird. Uh, I have no explanation for it, but I was able to adjust. And like I said, we had, I'd say, a 99% success rate this year uh i was catching fish so it was but i had to I had to do a lot of work to, to get it to that point yeah i can imagine and congratulations on hitting that success point that's that is definitely a challenge in the summer so it shows all those years of experience and planning all pay off right there word to the wise plan and go make an adjustment as you need so great job greg really seriously 
Well, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm, problem. Well, we're going to move into the end of the show here. It's going to be your last set of questions. But before we do that, we're going to go ahead and knock out one more bait check. It is your third and final bait check of the episode. This bait check is being brought to you by DS Custom Tackle. You looking to get your hands on some floats? Oh, he's got them, but a whole bunch of different ones. Hooks, beads, sinker slides, got it all. Maybe you need to get your hands on something for, I don't know, mullet. They got them. Modified mullet rigs, regular mullet rigs, spot rigs, the double drop hoochie squid if you're looking to get your hands on those. Maybe you're going out after something else, big drum, kingfish, purchase. A lot of different ones, not just the standard for Pompano. He's got, they've got rigs for just about all types of fishing up and down the East Coast and out there on the West Coast. So head on over to dscustomtackle.com, get you, find the rig that you want, need, and desire, get them set up. If you need something custom, you can also message them and they can work on getting you something new. dscustomtackle.com, get your order in today. So with the end of the whole game here, what knowledge would you like to give to a brand new angler? Patience. Uh, do your homework and be patient. Uh, it, it took me two years to pattern these fish, but with, with technology today, with YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, you can pretty much use, get a lot of local information. So I would say my first tip would be hit up the social media sites, get in with some local fishing groups on those websites and or on social media and you know, ask questions. You're going to get some crazy answers, but there's going to be some genuine people on there that want to help you out. Excuse me. But, you know, that, that would be, uh, as a, as a new surf fisherman or a new fisherman in any area, hit up the local tackle shops and ask questions. Don't be shy. Uh, they're going, they're not going to steer you wrong for the most part. They're going to try to get you with the right equipment. And when all else fails, our guide, uh, you know, I, I get a lot of people that call me and I will give them pointers. If they can't afford to hire me, I, I get it. it. It is what it is. And I, I'm like, if you're in town and you got a rod and reel here, this is the bait you probably want to use or, you know, and I'll, I'll send them to a location. I'd rather not do that, but I will. If you're, you know, if you're new to the area, Hey, it's a brotherhood. We're all like family in the fishing business until you're in my fishing spot. Yeah, that, that's, and then the gloves are off. <laughs> right, right. You know, even then, I'm pretty nice about it. But I mean, it, the beach is a free area. I have no rights to any area. But you know, when you when you got a spot and you're dead set on fishing it, and you get there and somebody else is there, it's like, wow. Okay, change of plans. Yeah. One thing we didn't bring up, actually, and I should have earlier, is we were talking about with your guide service and everything. You do a significant amount of fishing at night. Absolutely. Uh, of two reasons. I know how these where these fish congregate at night, but mainly because it's so freaking hot during the summer. Uh, we can get out there at night. Uh, it, you don't have to deal with the heat. Uh, you, you, we still have to deal with the humidity. Uh, if we don't have, when I mentioned something about, I like to have a breeze blowing, that's to keep the mosquitoes away. But mainly I fish at night during the summer and fall because it, it gets you out of the hottest part of the day. And it's just a lot more relaxing. I love it, man. Uh, the summer nighttime, I, I am a big, big performer of evening fishing just for that reason of, hey, yeah, it was hot. We're probably going to have a little bit more wind. And for some reason at sunset or sunset, I always feel like the sunset bite is more productive than the sunrise bite. I don't know why. Oh, it is. I mean, it can be. And that, from pompano to, to redfish yeah. to to blue, really everything starts biting just right at sunset. Uh, Jack Cravel, which is a big fish that I like to target personally. You, you know, I target them right at sunset. And that's my favorite time to go after them. Yeah. You uh, you throwing lures at them in the evening? I have. Now, I'm not as, as successful as some of the other locals around here because I just don't have time to go out every single day and target them. So, But when I do get a chance, I'm going to be throwing a big top water lure or a big spoon. Mm, those are so much fun to catch. I still have yet to. Uh, the last person I watched do it was uh, Arrington. Old saltwater mercs. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. 
he, I watched him one time. We went fishing on a boat, and he was just throwing it in, and all the rod just screamed. And I'm like, what the hell, man? And he's like, eh, it's a jack. Hold on. We'll go get it. It spit the hook in the end. He's like, damn it. But he was showing me tips and tricks. He's like, yeah, you can catch these things all the time, man. They're monsters. I was like, oh, oh that drag looked like a lot of fun. Yeah, I've had some clients catch them this year while we were red fishing, uh, where we would get set up just before dark, and we just luck of the draw, they'd hook into a big jack of bell, and it it is the hardest fighting fish in the surf by far. I have heard that, so yeah, I'm gonna have to add that to the list for this summer. Is heard fun things about them just for that right there. Well, let's get you out of here, man. This is the last question. What's next for you? Man, uh, I, I just really, this year, I'm going to try to focus a little more on my YouTube channel uh, and just keep entertaining these clients. And that is my love and my passion. I, I love taking people out fishing. And, you know, I don't want to toot my own horn, but, you know, I'm, I've gotten really good at, at putting people on fish. And so it's definitely my go-to. And that's my future right now as far as, far as i can see right now is i'm going to continue uh guiding and hopefully putting out more youtube content i normally had been leaving my camera gear at home because you know i do fish a lot at night and if anything can go wrong well it's going it's going to go wrong at night so trying to run a camera entertain the client it, it was just too much but this year i think i'm going to take somebody along that can run a camera whether I'm I'm shooting a video for the client to take home or for YouTube. Of course, it'd be a permission thing, but that's my goal. Just up my content on YouTube and uh, just keep focusing on my clients. Great stuff, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. I'm sorry it took me so long to get you here, and I'm sorry for the couple technical difficulties I ran into. But seriously, I, I, it's been a lot of great knowledge. I I picked up quite a few things to use for sure, and I'm sure the listeners have as well. So thank you really for, from best I can. Thank you so much for your time and, and willing to give up all this information. We really appreciate it. Man, I appreciate you inviting me on the show, and hopefully we can do another one in the future. But if not, we can definitely – Go fishing. Oh, yes. Yes to both, please. (laughs) All right, Greg. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. We just got done talking with Greg Friendly of Mad Dog Fishing. Lots of great stuff. I'm sure you picked up something because if you didn't, I don't know what you were missing there. There was a ton of great stuff sent out. Uh, I'm very excited to get you some more, hopefully, and we'll be getting some content out there. Yeah, like Greg said, he's got his YouTube going on, so go ahead and find it over there, Mad Dog Fishing. Lots of good stuff there. You can still find him on Facebook, Instagram, and at his website. All the links will be back on the either findingdemosurfishing.com. You can find all the information there or through the transistor page. It'll all be hyperlinked back so you can follow up with that. You've been listening to Finding Demo Surfishing. Thanks so much for being here. I'm always happy that you are. I look forward to getting with you next week. Lots more coming. You take care of yourselves. I am out of here.